Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And now I'm certain our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us. Let's go in and join him. Ah, you are, Mr. Burchell. Punctual to the minute, as always. <laughs> well, this is one doctor's appointment I'm eager to keep. <laughs> nice of you to say so, my boy. Draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Well, doctor, today is April the 1st. Did uh, anyone try and play any jokes on you? <laughs> yes, you did, Mr. Bartell, but I'm happy to say that nobody caught me. Uh, not as in the story that I'm going to tell you tonight, but an April Fool's Day prank certainly scored a bullseye. I see you have the dispatch box out again, Doctor. Been refreshing your memory? Yes, I have, Mr. Bartell. And when I tell you the adventure took place at 1881, I think you'll agree that after such a lapse of time, a man can hardly rely on memory alone. 1881? Say, Doctor, tonight's adventure must have been one of the really early ones. Yes, it was indeed. In fact, to be exact, it took place only a little while after Sherlock Holmes and I had first met and taken up lodgings together. How was the great detective in those early days? <laughs> a profound mystery to me, Mr. Bartell. To give you an example, my boy, I shared our Baker Street lodgings with him for over a month before I was even certain of his profession, the knowledge of which I learnt to my awe and astonishment when our first adventure together took place. Well, that was the one you called uh, a study in Scarlet, wasn't it, That's Doctor? That's right, Mr. Bartell. The memory you've got study in Scarlet. Uh, but even after that adventure, I found myself wondering at times what I had let myself in for, sharing lodgings with Mr. Strange companion. It was in one of those moods of doubt and confusion that my story begins. Late one March evening, I found myself in the neighborhood of Piccadilly Circus. It was cold, and a steady drizzle of rain had dampened my spirits. I felt that a glass of wine and the sound of music would put me in a better mood. And, and so, Mr. Bartell, I entered the Criterion restaurant. As I sat with a glass of rare vintage port at my elbow, the orchestra playing a dreamy Strauss waltz in the background, I couldn't help thinking of the last time that I'd been there. It was the night I met a young medical student by the name of Stamford. He was the man who first introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. Suddenly, I felt a clap on my shoulder. I turned, and to my amazement, once again, young Stamford was standing before me. Watson, or should I say Dr. Watson, how are you, my dear chap? Hello, Stamford. Come and sit down. Thanks. I'm glad to see that you're not holding any grudge against me. Why on earth should I do that? for introducing you to Sherlock Holmes. I've reproached myself ever since. I think he's as mad as a hatter. Not at all. He may be eccentric. In fact, I'll admit that he is eccentric, but he's an extraordinarily interesting fellow. He'll make a great name for himself as a private detective one of these days. You'll see if I'm not right, Stamford. I saw something about him in the paper the other day. Yes, I think that was the Larston Gardens affair, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes, it was. He's a brilliant man, Stamford. Quite brilliant. Hmm. Though I must admit he's difficult at times. He works like a fiend as a rule, but occasionally a reaction sets in him for days at a time. He'll lie on our sofa, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. It's depressing, I must say. I think he takes himself too seriously. Yes, perhaps you're right. How would you like to join in a little plot? Plot uh, against Holmes? Yes, yes, uh, just a rag, you know. We thought it'd be rather fun. We? Murphy and I, we were just talking about it. I'll call him over. Murphy? Oh, is that Murphy? I, I've seen him before somewhere, haven't I? I'm sure you must have done. He's been around at the hospital, and any time you go into the British Museum, you'll find him there. Nice fellow, but dull, definitely dull. Uh, yes, Stamford. Oh, uh, this is a friend of mine, John Watson. Uh, this is James Murphy. How do you do? I think I've seen you at the hospital. And I know I've seen you, Dr. Watson. Oh, sit down and come and join us, won't you? Oh, thank you very much. I was just telling Watson about our little plot. Oh, you you, you mean about uh, Sherlock Holmes? Now, now, look here. I'd like you fellows to realize that Holmes is a very good friend of mine. Oh, don't worry, Watson. This is all in good fun. Don't you realize what the date is tomorrow? First of April, isn't it? Yes, April Fool's Day. Oh, now I see. You're going to play an April Fool's Day joke on... On Holmes. Yes, that's our plan. Well, it's hardly our plan, Stamford. It's really Lady Anne Partington's idea. You see, Holmes was very rude to her when she visited the hospital recently, and she wants to, uh, well, you know, take him down a peg or two. Oh, sounds innocent enough. But I must say, he's inclined to be rather arrogant at times. Well, what's, what's the plan? Well, we'll need your help, Watson. You must be careful not to give the joke away. I'll bet you a fiver that Holmes falls for the whole story, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> now, here's exactly what we're planning to do. Lady Anne is going to call on Holmes at Baker Street. That was a good call to see me in my professional capacity. Surely, my dear man, you didn't think this was a social call. You were much too rude to me at the hospital the other day for that. 
That was the point I was trying to make. Uh, please sit down, won't you? Please, uh, take this chair, won't you, Lady Alice? It's by far the most comfortable chair in the room. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, what can I do to help you? You've heard of the Elphinstone Emerald? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. A magnificent stone of very considerable value. An heirloom in your family, I believe. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I keep it in a wall safe in my bedroom. This morning, when I had occasion to go to the safe, I discovered that the emerald had been stolen. Stolen? Scott, what a shocking business. Of course, you want Mr. Holmes to recover it for you. A remarkable deduction, my dear doctor. Uh, Lady Anne, when you opened the safe, did you observe any signs of it having been tampered with? Oh, I, I think it's rather stupid to sit and answer questions here in Baker Street. Uh, why don't you come over to my house in Cavendish Square and examine the safe for yourself? Uh... You are a detective, aren't you? Uh, Lady Anne, uh, just now you accused me of rudeness. I assure you that mine, at least, was unintentional. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Don't be so touchy. I can promise you a substantial fee, Mr. Holmes. I'm a struggling practitioner in a new profession, eh? My poverty, but not my will, consents. I pay thy poverty, and not thy will. You see, I can quote my Shakespeare, too, Mr. Holmes. My carriage is waiting, gentlemen. Let's drive over to Cavendish Square at once, shall we? <laughs> at the wall safe, Mr. Holmes. Mm, not too difficult a safe to crack for an expert. You placed the emerald in it last night, you say? Yes, when I went to bed. And this morning, it had gone. Well, surely, Holmes, this is a good occasion to use that magnifying glass that you're always fitting about Excellent with. Excellent occasion, my dear doctor. That's why I brought it with me. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. What is it? This safe was opened by an expert. There isn't a sign of its having been forced. Hello. What have you discovered? There's a peculiar tarnish on the steel knob was obviously handled by someone whose fingers are habitually stained with chemicals. Amazing, Holmes. Let me mention, my dear doctor, uh, where does that door lead to? My boudoir. I should like to examine it, if I may. Oh, but of course. Thank you, Lady Anne. Dr. Watson, this is the most beautiful April Fool's Day fraud I've ever played. Yes, I must say Murphy was right. He has fallen for it. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Just to say, I'm beginning to feel guilty. I can't help feeling a, a bit disloyal. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. It's all in fun. Are Stamford and Mr. Murphy listening? Yes, they're next door in my drawing room. I'm sure their ears are positively glued to the keyhole. Well, I do hope Holmes won't be angry with me. Sh here he comes. Nothing of any interest in there. The windows haven't been tampered with. We may presume, therefore, that the thief did not enter by an upstairs window. Uh, Lady Anne. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This room has not been touched since you discovered your loss. Oh, no. I told the servants to leave it exactly as it was while I came to fetch you. Splendid, splendid. Deep file carpet, eh? Could be better. Uh, the thief was a tall man with a long stride. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. I know your methods, but there aren't any footprints on this carpet that, that you can identify, even with your magnifying glass. My dear doctor, I've studied many crimes, and I've never seen one yet that uh, was committed by a flying creature. As long as a criminal remains on his two legs, there must be some, some trifling displacement can be detected by a keen observer... I assure you that the marks on this carpet indicate that the thief uh, was a tall man with a long stride. Mm -hmm. Faces of tobacco ash. Pipe tobacco. Tag tobacco that sells at Hopin's an ounce. Oh, now, really, Mr. Holmes, how can you possibly identify an individual tobacco? Oh, it's a hobby of mine. In fact, I've even written a monograph on the subject. Now, one more look at the safe itself. Hello. What's this part of dust here? It's rosin. A distinct trace of rosin. Lady Anne, I suggest that you get in touch with Scotland Yard at once. You mean that you've solved it, Holmes? I mean, my dear doctor, that I can give you a reasonably complete picture of the thief, and that picture is so individual that I'd be surprised if it would fit more than one man in London. Why, this is pure magic, Mr. Holmes. Please describe him to me. Uh, well, he's a tall man. The width of his stride indicates that, and he's thin. Well, what enables you to tell that, Holmes? His footprints have made a remarkably light indentation on the map of the carpet. Our thief dabbles extensively in chemicals, as indicated by the tarnishing of the knob on the safe, and the traces of rosin would suggest that he plays the violin also. He smokes shag tobacco, has a great practical knowledge of the ways of combination locks, and he's obviously in close contact with the criminal classes. How do you know that, Mr. Holmes? Well, he wouldn't steal a famous stone unless he knew how to dispose of it through some trustworthy fence. Yes, it's a very comprehensive picture, Holmes. I almost feel as if I knew the chap. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sure there's only one man in London, and it shouldn't be hard to trace him. 
I agree entirely, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, I think the joke has gone far enough. Joke? Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> You're quite right, Holmes, and in, in think there's only one such man in London. You've just given a perfect description of yourself. Oh, April Fool. <laughs> Dr. Stamford, Mr. Murphy, you can come in now. April Fool, Holmes. April Fool. April Fool. April Fool. <laughs> Into the drawing room, everyone. Let us drink a glass of wine to Mr. Holmes, who has so graciously forgiven us for the little trick we played on him. And also to Dr. Stamford, who thought of the whole idea. Uh, no hard feelings, Holmes. Oh, no, Doctor. No, it was a rather embarrassing experience. Yes, Murphy told me about the plan. I, I just couldn't resist joining him. Ah, here you are, Holmes. Here's a drink. Thank you, Stamford. You know Murphy, don't you? Uh, no, I don't think we've met. How do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do, Holmes? How did you like the little game we played on you? It was rather a salutary experience. I suppose you gave them all the details to build up the picture of me, eh, hey, yes, Doctor? Yes, I did, Holmes, and knowing some of your methods, we tried to plant every clue that you'd pick up. <laughs> Very neat job, too, and incidentally, <laughs> a perfect example of the dangers of deductions based on purely circumstantial evidence. I shall profit from this little lesson. I must say it was worth a fortune in emeralds to see your face, Holmes, when you realized what you'd done. Well, the joke's over now. By the way, where is Lady Anne? I believe she said she was going to fetch the Orphanstone emerald. She thought you might be interested in seeing it. She probably feels the sight of it will salve my wounded vanity. <laughs> oh, here she comes now. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! Mr. Scott, what's wrong? What's happened, Lady Anne? The emerald. It's not where I hid it. This time it's really stolen. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, your April Fool Day plot kind of backfired on you, didn't it? Yes, Mr. Bartell, it was a perfect example of the, uh, of the biter bit. <laughs> well, what happened next? I suppose Sherlock Holmes went into action once again. Yes, uh, Mr. Bartell, and it gladdened my heart to see the change in the fuller. I confess I'd felt rather ashamed of my part in the prank, for I could see that Holmes's pride had been hurt. But now... With a definite crime before him, the difference was amazing. He suddenly became a dynamo, galvanized into action as he stood there, firing questions at the other members of the... Lady Anne, who besides yourself knew of this fresh hiding place? Both Murphy and I did. Yes. Uh, after we'd left our deliberate clues on the safe, we went with Lady Anne and saw her secrete the emerald in the top drawer of her dressing table. We thought it would be all right there. After all, as soon as the joke was over, I was going to put it back in the safe. Now, I think our wisest plan before we question the servants would be for each one of you who were in this April Fool's Day prank to submit to being searched. Holmes, surely you don't suggest that any one of us took the emerald? No, Stamford, I don't. Uh, but if any one of you four are not guilty, this will be a splendid way of proving your innocence. I say, steady, Holmes. You're not suggesting that Lady Anne stole her own emeralds, are you? Are you, Mr. Holmes? I'm suggesting nothing, but I may point out that the recent vogue for the insurance companies has provided another interesting motive for these so-called thefts. Oh, I resent your insinuation. It's outrageous. Lady Anne, if I'm to recover your emerald, I must at least consider every possibility. A search is the most immediate practical action. Perhaps you'll retire into the next room while I persuade these gentlemen to submit to being searched. Very well, but but I think you're in danger of making a fool of yourself once again. No, wait, don't, don't go, Lady Anne. A search won't be necessary. What do you mean, Murphy? I... I must throw myself on your mercy, Lady Anne. I confess that I stole the emerald. Murphy! After you put it in the drawer, Lady Anne, I, I slipped back into the room and took it out. Murphy, that's a criminal action. I, I know it, but I'm poor. I need money desperately for my mathematical research. I knew the emerald was priceless, and I... Well, I couldn't resist the temptation to take advantage of a joke. Here, Lady Anne, here's the stone, and please don't prosecute me. Please don't. It'd be my ruin. May I examine the emerald, Lady Anne? Thank you. Well, Mr. Murphy, I won't pretend that I'm not deeply shocked. I must ask you to leave my house. But you won't prosecute me, will you? It was a moment's temptation. No, uh, no, I won't prosecute you. Holmes, what are you doing with the emerald? Well, knowing something of the deceptive ways of thieves, I came on this case fully prepared to test the emerald when I found it. Now, uh, a drop of this acid from this vial, so... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing? You'll enter the stone. Uh, no, uh, not if it's a true emerald. Uh-huh, look at that. Good Lord, the acid's eating to the stone as if it was sugar. But then that means... That... It means, Lady Anne, that Mr. Murphy has just imperiled his honor and his freedom to steal a singularly beautiful fake. Mr. 
Mr. Holmes, this joke has turned into a nightmare. Is there no way of recovering my emeralds? I hope so, Lady Anne. I've been taking steps in their logical order. The servants have all been questioned. We've searched Mr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy. Yes, most humiliating experience. Made me feel like a criminal. Well, personally, I was only too thankful to submit to a search this time. I, I knew I had nothing to worry about. You yourself, Lady Anne, you, you consented to being searched by the police matron that Holmes sent for? Only because he threatened to send for the police if I didn't. But distasteful though it was, I'd rather endure that than have this story on the front pages of the newspapers. And in spite of all these rather unfriendly proceedings, we've got exactly nowhere as regards finding the emerald. No, Stamford, but we have at least eliminated the possibility that the thief is secreting the jewel on his person. It's still somewhere in these two rooms, eh, Holmes? I think so, though there is one remaining possibility. And that is? that the fake stone was substituted for the real emerald sometime before all of you engineered your April Fool's Day joke. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, that's not possible. I know it was the genuine emerald I took out of the safe this morning. How can you be sure? The substitute was an excellent imitation. Without a chemical test such as I performed, it would be hard to be certain. I can tell you why I'm certain. Last night, Papa came to dinner and brought a Mr. Vanderleider of Amsterdam. He examined the stone. And you'll agree that a jewel expert like that couldn't be fooled. That's true, Lady Anne. And what did you do with the emerald after Mr. Van der Leider left? I locked it in my safe and went to bed. Mm -hmm. I didn't unlock the safe again until Dr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy came here this morning. That settles it, then. The real emerald is still hidden somewhere in these two rooms. But where? That's the question. I must say it's completely mystifying. Well, let's go back to what we were all doing at the exact moment you came into the room, Lady Anne, and informed us of the loss of your stone. Now, we were... We were drinking a toast to you That's and... That's it. Uh, Lady Anne, hard thinking is, uh... Well, it's thirsty work. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get you something. Uh, a glass of port, perhaps. No, no, thank you. But I, uh... I observe that you have a remarkably comprehensive assortment of liqueurs. I wonder if I might have a glass of creme de menthe. Oh, of course. I'll get it for you. Creme de menthe in the middle of the day, Holmes? I knew you were eccentric, but this Holmes, really... Holmes, this bottle, it... It clinked as I picked it up. I thought it might, Lady Anne. There's something inside it. Allow me, madam. Thank you. I'm sure you won't mind if I waste this liqueur on the aspidestra. Oh, no, so. Lady Anne, allow me to restore to you the Elphinson Emerald. Great Scott. Amazing. Fantastic. Ingenious. The one safe hiding place in the room. Where could a green gem be more effectively hidden than in a bottle of green liqueur? But who stole it? Who substituted the fake stone? Frankly, I don't care. The gem is restored. That's all that matters. Uh, I prefer not to go to court. Neither you nor I, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would show up in the best of lights. And my father would disapprove of this whole affair, I'm afraid. Just as you wish, Lady Anne. In either case, I shall expect your check for my services in due course. <laughs> Criterion again, Stamford. Won't you come in and join us for lunch? Thanks, Watson, but I'll keep the cab and go on. I actually have a patient this afternoon. A rare and delightful experience for a young doctor, as you probably know. <laughs> as rare and delightful as a client is for a young detective, eh, Stamford? Yeah. I quite understand, and I'm correspondingly grateful to you for your, your profitable hopes. I'm glad it was profitable for you. Personally, I feel pretty stupid about the whole thing. Well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, right. fella. Goodbye. 39 Onslow Square, cabby. You're remarkably quiet, Mayford. Well, I, I'm afraid my conscience won't let me do much talking, Doctor. I'm heartily ashamed of myself. Well, thanks for the lift. I'll, I'll leave you traps. Oh, Robinson Johnson, you'll join us for lunch, Murphy. But, uh... No buts about it, I insist. Come on. Well, it's awfully nice of you. Oh, come, 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 Murphy. Any one of us can make a foolish mistake. It's just lucky that you didn't have to pay for yours. Monsieur wishes it, David. Yes, for three, please. This way, Monsieur. Does this table please you? Excellent, thank you. All right, George, I'm as hungry as a hunter. How about you, Murphy? No, I'm afraid I have very little appetite. This whole case has upset me oh. dreadfully. You mustn't take it so much to heart, Murphy. Uh, by the way, Doctor, I'd like to have your opinion on the case. Who do you think staged the theft of the emerald today? Perfectly obvious to me. Lady Anne Parlington did it herself to collect the insurance money. If she hadn't, she'd have insisted on your finding the thief. But uh, you needn't worry, old chap. 
You get your fee all right, I'm sure oh, of that. Oh, I'm not worrying about the fee. But I assure you, Lady Anne did not engineer that fraud today. You, you, you mean that it was Stanford? <laughs> Tell him who was responsible, my dear Murphy. But how should I know? Oh, how... come now, Murphy. Let's not fence any longer. You did an excellent job, a superlative job. I was uh, almost sorry to spoil it for you. I don't think I understand you, Holmes. Oh, yes, you do, Murphy. You're a splendid actor, too. I was so deeply touched when you had apparently stolen a fake jewel, and uh, all the time you knew that the real one was safely hidden in the bottle of creme de menthe. To be abstracted at uh, your leisure. <laughs> you scoundrel. Holmes, do you mind telling me what's going on here? I'm completely and absolutely in the dark. Surely it's obvious, my dear doctor. The imitation emerald was a brilliant copy. What makes you so sure of that, my dear Holmes? Because this April Fool's Day hoax was only conceived yesterday, or that is what you wish the others to believe. Such a superb paste gem could not have been made at such short notice. Therefore, it must have been prepared by someone who knew about the hoax before it was arranged. Now, my dear doctor, when Stamford told you about the plan last night, whose idea did he say it was? He told me that it was Lady Anne Partington's plan. Precisely, ma'am. And yet Lady Anne referred to it today as Stamper's idea. Obviously, you, my dear Murphy, presented the plan to each as the notion of the other, and so only you could have arranged the real theft behind the hoax. I repeat, <laughs> a splendid job. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. May I, uh, may I also compliment you on your cleverness in frustrating my plot? Look here, what is all this? One of you is a criminal, the other is a detective. If you're throwing each other compliments as if you were in the same profession. The dividing line between the criminal and the criminal investigator is thinner than you might imagine, my dear doctor. How very true, my dear Holmes. Would you consider coming over to my side of the line? Together we'd make an unbeatable team. Oh, oh. oh you flatter me. Nevertheless, I must decline your offer, Mr. Murphy. Oh, a pity. On your side of the line, you'll never be a rich man. By the way, for your edification, my name is not Murphy. Though Stamford insists on thinking it is. Then what is your name, you scoundrel? <laughs> your friend says the word scoundrel is so much better than you, Doctor. Uh, my name? My name is Murtry. Oh, indeed. Uh, spelled M-U-R-T-R-Y? No. Dear me, I have so much trouble with my name. People will either misspell it or mispronounce it. I'm afraid I'll have to begin calling it the way it looks. M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y. Moriarty. Moriarty. I shall remember that name. I have a feeling we shall meet again. I trust that we shall. You've won the first round, Sherlock Holmes. I admit that. But I believe that um, a return match is indicated. I shall look forward to it, Moriarty. And now, Doctor, I can't stand your baleful glare any longer. Let's order lunch, shall we? <laughs> Doctor, that was a pretty hectic April Fool's Day. Yes, it was. I never want to see another one exactly like it. I don't blame you. <laughs> you know, I'd sure hate to have someone come to my house and pull a trick like that on me. Why, Mr. Bartell, do you have a precious emerald you, you fear may be stolen? Are you kidding? <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference between a precious emerald and a piece of green glass. But when it comes to rubies, now that's something else. Oh, you would know a ruby when you, when you saw it. Sure. Well, Dr. Watson, what's the prescription for next week's story? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a rather unusual story. It concerns a series of strange disappearances and a murder without apparent reason. And yet, it was a case that Sherlock Holmes solved without ever meeting any of the suspects. I call it the singular affair of the disappearing scientist. Well, I'm sure we'll all want to hear that one, Doctor. Oh, I'm sure. Well, we're going to... Oh, well, before you go, Mr. Bartell, I want to urge our friends to do all they can to save on the use of all wheat and rice products and also fats and oils. There are millions of families literally starving to death in Europe and Asia. They're not being asked to give them our food. They're just being asked to take it easy on certain foods so that there will be some left for them to buy. I know there isn't one person listening to me tonight who would knowingly let anyone starve. And remember, unless you do help, thousands of little children will starve. So please, let's share a meal and save a life. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios.
This is Harry Bartell saying good night. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Punctual to the minute, as usual. Drop a chair and settle down, my boy. Well, I won't settle down too far, Doctor. You have a habit of keeping me on the edge of my chair during most of your stories. Uh, just it should be, Mr. Bartell. I hope tonight will prove no exception, so light up your pipe and I'll get on with my story. Doctor, from the hint you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a thriller. How did it begin? On a cold winter morning in 1897, Holmes and I, our breakfast just concluded, sat on either side of a cheery fire in our Baker Street lodging. A thick fog rolled down between the line of dun-colored houses, and the opposite windows loomed like dark, shapeless blurs with a heavy yellow wreath. Another London pea super, huh, Doctor? Exactly, Mr. Bartell. Our gas was lit and shone its flicking light on the white cloth and glimmer of china, for the breakfast table had not been cleared. Holmes was busy cross-indexing his record of crime, while I was engrossed in one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. Our morning was not destined, however, to be a quiet one. For shortly after 11 o'clock, Mrs. Hudson ushered a young lady into our room. A young lady... Down, won't you, young lady? I'm, I'm Dr. Watson, and, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, gentlemen? I must apologize for not giving my name to your housekeeper, but I have to be so careful. This is what you require to tell, my dear. Of course, you're wondering who I am and what's brought me here. My own theory would be that you are Miss Harriet Irving, and that you come to me to enlist my aid in proving that Mr. Binion did not murder your father. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? You're absolutely correct, Mr. Holmes. But what? how did you know? I deduced it, Miss Irving. You're wearing very new and extremely expensive mourning, presumably for the first time, since a few basting threads are still in evidence. You wear no rings, so evidently you're not in mourning for a husband. The only man whose death the papers announced in the past few days and who left a young daughter uh, wealthy enough to purchase such garments is Sir Edward Irving. And since the police have already made an arrest, obviously you wish me to uh, uh, disprove the police theory and intercede for young Binion. Mr. Holmes, you're wonderful. That's just what I wanted to do. You will, won't you? Uh, Miss Irving, I've studied the newspaper reports very carefully. It would seem to me that Scotland Yard has... Uh, Arrested the right man. Well, I'm very sorry, but I didn't read the newspaper reports. I have the faintest idea what you're both talking about. Then uh, let me bring you up to date, my dear fellow. Mm -hmm. And please correct me, Miss Irvin, if I make any mistakes. Three days ago, Sir Edward Irvin, the father of this young lady, was found stabbed to death in his study. Oh, the only entrance oh, to the study is through an anteroom, where his secretary had been sitting ever since Sir Edward was last seen alive. And the secretary swore that no one had entered or left the study. The secretary's name being uh, Binion, I suppose. Yes, under the circumstances, it's hard to see that any other arrest was possible. And yet I know he's innocent, Mr. Holmes. Oh, and how do you know that, Miss Irvin? We were in love. We were going to be married. I don't care what the police say. A woman knows these things. Robert Binion did not kill my father. Did your father approve of the engagement? Well, no, not exactly. If one were to be exact, Miss Evan, wouldn't one say that uh, your father absolutely forbade the marriage? Yes, he did. And Inspector Lestrade assumed death was the motive for the murder. Well... Sounds logical, I must say. Does your father have any other relatives living, Miss Irvin? His brother, my Uncle Peregrine. Uh, he lives a hermit's life in the country. We've seen very little of him in the last few years. Was he left anything under your father's will? No, I was the sole beneficiary. Please help me, Mr. Holmes. If you'll just talk to Robert, you'll know he's not guilty. Oh, there's no harm in talking to him, Holmes. After all, our old friend the star handled the case, and he's made a good many mistakes in the past. Well, yeah. Haven't we all, old chap? Well, Miss Irvin, I'll do what I can, but I promise nothing. Bless you, Mr. Uh, where is your fiancé being held? At Scotland Yard. I talked to him there just before I came to Scotland you. Scotland Yard, eh? Splendid, eh? We can talk to the stars at the same time. Watson, your hat... My hat and coat? Uh, precisely, old fellow, your hat and coat. So, <laughs> Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson... Think they know more than the yard, eh? 
Come over here to teach us our business, I suppose. Nothing of the sort, Lestard. We came over here to make a few inquiries. I'll tell you, gentlemen, that you're wasting your time. Young Binion is guilty, whatever his young lady may say. Lestard? Yes, Mr. Holmes? Uh, what did the autopsy prove? Well, I've got a report of it here on my desk, but uh, it won't tell you nothing you don't know. Mm-hmm. Death was instantaneous, caused by some weapon like a long needle, a fine stiletto, or an ice pick. Penetrating the brain at the base of the skull. And no such weapon was found in the room. Or on Mr. Binion. True, sir. But then he had the chance of disposing of it. Just the same, the murder weapon hasn't been found, has it? No, Doctor, but we'll find it. Don't you worry about that. I should like to talk to the prisoner, if you don't mind. Well, of course I don't mind. He's in the uh, detention cell just down the corridors from here. Uh, Follow me, gentlemen. Has he given you any trouble, Lestat? Trouble? (laughs) If all our prisoners were as quiet as him, we wouldn't need no guard, Doctor. Nice, quiet young fellow. Hard to realize he's a murderer. A fact that still has to be proven in court, Lestrade. A fact that is going to be proved in court, Mr. Holmes. Well, here we are at this cell. You've uh, got visitors, Binion. Very distinguished visitors. Who are you, gentlemen? Uh, my name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. I'm sorry to see you in this sight, Mr. Binion. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then Harriet did come and see you when she left here. I'm so glad. You'll get me out of this mess. I know you will. Even Mr. Sherlock Holmes can't get you out of this one, young fellow. Mr. Binion, I promised your fiancé that I'd try and help you. My obvious course is to go to Sir Edward's house and examine the room in which the tragedy occurred. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you a question or two. Ask me any question you want to, sir. It was you who discovered the body, I understand. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Please describe the circumstances. Sir Edward was in his study. I had been working in the anteroom adjoining. At five o'clock, I went in to say good night to him, and I found him slumped in his chair, dead, with blood streaming down the back of his head. Of course, I sent the butler for the police at once. Could anyone have entered that room without your knowledge? No, Mr. Holmes. I never left my desk. And there was no other entrance to the room save through my office. How about the windows in Sir Edward's room? They were locked from the inside, Doctor. Oh, you don't need to worry. We examined the window ledges. Not a mark. No one came in that way. Now, what is your theory of the murder, Mr. Binion? I haven't one, Mr. Holmes. I'm completely baffled. I'm certain that no one entered that room. Yet I swear to you that I didn't stab him. So I can understand the police believing I did. Mm-hmm. Mr. Stan, I should like to examine the room in which Sir Edward was murdered. Well, the easiest thing in the world, Mr. Holmes. I'll drive over with you, if you like. His house is in night. Oh, place. you needn't bother, Lestrade. We can, we can quite well go by ourselves. Oh, eh? not a bit of it, Doctor. I'd like to come with you. Oh, oh, oh why, Lestrade? Yeah. You're, you're convinced Mr. Binion is guilty? Are you? Well, won't you? Won't you be wasting time? Not me. <laughs> For once I know you're on the wrong side of a case, Mr. Holmes. And I want to be there and see your faces when you find it out. <laughs> This is the house, Mr. Holmes. Yes, imposing looking place, I must say. I imagine, Lestrade, that you still have a police guard inside. Oh, yes, Doctor. There's been a sergeant guard in the dead man's room day and night. Uh, we uh, still haven't found the missing weapon, you know. Yes, gentlemen. I'm Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. We uh, wish to examine the house. I must see your identification, sir. What are you talking about? I've been in and out of this house half a dozen times. I have my orders, sir. Oh, very well. Is Miss Irvin at home? Miss Irvin is not receiving, sir. Great Scott, man, can't you give us any information? There's been tragedy in this house, sir, and the truth of it's not so yet. I'm not answering any questions, but I don't have to. Yeah, here now. Does this uh, police guard satisfy you? Hmm. Inspector Lestrade. Very good, Inspector. You may uh-huh. come in. Uh-huh. May I direct you, gentlemen? Oh, no, thank you. I know this house nearly as well as you do. I think not, Inspector. I've served here for 27 years. Now, well, gentlemen, if you're not needing me, I'll return to my quarters. Bless my soul. That's a sinister looking chap if I ever saw one. Yes, and he knows something. <laughs> you see, Lestrade, there is a possibility that Binion is innocent. Yes, sir. 
I began to see that, sir, when you were talking to the butler. You're being very cryptic. What other possibility are you talking about? The possibility is that Binion, the arrested man, is shielding the real murderer. And whom would he be most certain to shield? You mean his fiancée, Miss Miss Irvin? That's right, old fellow. What? Uh, Here we are. Uh, This is the ante room where young Binion worked. And that door there leads into the study where Sir Edward was found. Nothing been touched, of course, since the discovery of the crime? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. Uh, that's why we've had a constable on duty in there night and day. Uh, before the trial, we're bringing experts in to uh, test the room for secret panels or anything of that kind. Let's examine the dead man's room, shall we? Oh, right you are, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Webster. Webster, get out of that chair and stand up, can't you? You're on duty. Asleep. Carty. He's dead. Yes. The trickle of blood oozing out from the base of his skull. Well, strike me pink. He's being killed the same way as Sir Edward was. I presume you'll agree that Mr. Binion didn't commit this murder, Lestrade. Well, of course not, Mr. Holmes. He couldn't have done it. He's locked up at the yard. Well, what are we going to do? Ask the butler to come here, will you? Oh, well, right you are, sir. Uh, what do you make of their wound, Doctor? Well, it's a tip of the description of the one that killed Sir Edward. There's a fine puncture here at the, the base of the skull. Hi, Joe Holmes. They mentioned a stiletto on ice pick. A wound like this might be caused by one of those long steel hat pins that, that women wear. Yes, it's a possibility, Watson. A distinct possibility. And Miss Irvin was wearing a long hat pin this morning, if you remember. Uh-huh. Glass walls. A little chance of secret panels here, I should say. And the window locked from the inside, eh? Yeah. Here he is, Miss Holmes. Oh, yes, and by the way, what's your name? Trevor, sir. You see what's happened, Trevor? Yes, sir. I see. The constable's been killed just like my master. Now, tell me, Trevor, is this room exactly as it was in Sir Edward's lifetime? Yes, sir. Except that my master's not in the habit of keeping the corpses of policemen in here. Yeah, oh. Don't try to be funny, Trevor. Don't you realize you're mixed up in a murder case? I meant no offense, gentlemen. Well, marks in the bad taste, my good fellow. The point of my question, Trevor, was to find out if any of the furniture in here had been moved lately. Not moved, sir. But there has been a piece of furniture added. That armchair the dead man lying in. The same chair in which Sir Edward's body was found. Of course, that's the answer. Trevor, when was that chair delivered? And who delivered it? It was delivered the day before Sir Edward died. It came from Silver Schwartz's antique shop in Bonds. Uh Aha, sir. That gains a foot, Mr. Stroud. See to the removal of this poor man's body. Seal the room, and for heaven's sake, keep this latest death a secret for a day at least. Within that time, I hope to have your murderer for you. Then we're going... We're going, my dear chap, to Silver Schwartz's antique shop in Bond Street. Music boxes are quite charming, Holmes, aren't they? Yes, but where's Mr. Silberschwanz? This is probably him. What a fine-looking old fellow. Oh, Mr. Silberschwanz. Yes, gentlemen. You are interested in musical boxes? No, sir, in chairs. Particularly in the handsomely carved chair you delivered to Sir Edward Irvin a few days ago. Ah, yeah, a magnificent specimen. He's pleased with it. He was found dead in it, Mr. Silberschwanz. And half an hour ago, someone else was found dead in it also. That chair was one of a pair, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Fully forgotten him. That's impossible. Please, please to follow me. I, I will show you it's not possible. Look, look at the chair. It's exactly like the same one as uh, Sir Edward's house. Oh, my friend, but there's such a difference. Mm, 15th century Italian, isn't it? Yeah, this is one of a pair of the famous Malifiero armchairs. There are only three pairs in the world, my friend. Of this pair, one, the one I delivered to Sir Edward, is simply a great specimen of the carpet art. This one is made. Looks exactly like it, does it not? Exactly. I can't see any difference, Mr. Holmes. You would if you sat in it, old chap. Precisely. That is why I have these cords stretched from one arm of the chair to the other. If anyone were to, to sit in it well, sometimes nothing will happen. But sooner or later, a hand will press this hidden spring in the arm here, and death will strike. But nothing happened when you pressed the spring then, Mr. Silver Holmes? No, I, I, I don't understand. I do. This is the harmless chair. The lethal one was sent to Sir Edward. He sat in it, accidentally pressed the spring and drove the fatal needle into his brain. Just as that poor constable did today. Sir Edward bought both chairs, I presume. Yeah, I would not sell it. They're uh, separate. 
Then why didn't you deliver both at the same time? He was afraid of the deadly one. He asked me to, to keep it here until he found a safe place for it in his home. Mm-hmm. And some devil switched the arm cord from the fatal chair to the harmless one so that you delivered death to Sir Edward. There is a subtlety in this crime worthy of the fiendish maker of the chairs himself. Through the Schwartz. Yeah, my head. Didn't Alapieri die of being tricked into seating himself in one of his own chairs? Yeah, yeah, he did. Ah, poet justice. I'm much obliged to you, Silver Schwartz. Now I think I know how to trap our killer. Well, Dr. Watson, this is quite a story you're telling us tonight. So you found out how the murders had been committed, but not who'd been responsible for it. Yes, quite right, Mr. Bartell. Holmes spent a long time cross-examining Mr. Silverschwanz, the owner of the antique store, as to who might have had the opportunity of switching the telltale cord from the fatal chair. And who did have that opportunity, well, Doctor? Well, Mr. Bartell, it transpired that four people might have been responsible. Mr. Edward's daughter, his secretary, Mr. Binion, had both been in the shop with him at various times. So had the Dr. Trevor's. The fourth suspect was Sir Edward's eccentric brother, Peregrine, who it appeared had dropped into the shop the day after the purchase had been made. With this last information, Holmes became very excited and launched into eager preparations, which ended a few hours later when we found ourselves disguised as furniture removers, driving a van along a quiet country lane near Dorking as we approached the house of Sir Edward's brother, Peregrine. There's the house, Watson. Ramshackle-looking place, isn't it? Yes, it's extremely so. <laughs> Why are you so morose, my dear chap? I've hardly spoken a word on our drive down never here. never told me anything. Why are we trundling off into the wilds of the country disguised as furniture removers and carrying the harmless chair with us? Surely the reason is transparent, old chap? Yes, it's just about as transparent as duff stocking full of hot tripe. Oh, <laughs> my dear Watson. Surely it's obvious that we're up against an extremely cunning murderer. Now, what advantage accrues to him in using the Malapiero chair? An alibi, of course. He's nowhere near the place where the murder happens. Precisely. Apply your logic a little further. Three of the suspects, the daughter, Mr. Binion, and Trevor's, the butler, live in the house and would almost certainly have been present at the time of death. Therefore, who gains most by such an alibi? Well, the, the brother, Peregrine. Elementary, my dear Watson. Now you see why we trundled off into the wilds of Dorking. Well, that must be Peregrine standing up on the porch. He's a funny-looking fellow. Oh, my lead, Watson. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, you uh, fellows must have come to the wrong house. Uh, you were uh, Mr. Pettigrine over on, ain't you, Governor? Yes. And we come to the right house. All right, all right, all right. Come on, Bertie, give us a hand. Uh, right you are our feet. What, what, what the devil is one loading an arm chair? Get out of there, You drop it on my foot, Bertie. Look at it. Easy does it. Come on, Bert. That's I right. got it, Al. I got it. Right. Set it me easy now on the porch here. There, there you go. go. There. Ah. Give me a crickets. I had a pretty chair, Governor. Bertie and me was admiring it on our way down here. Oh, blimey, you know, off a nice chair. <laughs> but who told you to bring it here? Orders, Governor. Mr. Silver Snitch. What whatever his name is. <laughs> Tell us your brother didn't want the chair and said as how uh, we was to bring it to you. But my brother's dead. Mr. Silver Snitch said uh, he, he gave the order before he died. Why don't I sit down in it, Governor? Oh, no, of course not, of course not. Cool, lummy. <laughs> Bit of all right, isn't it? Look at him laughing. <laughs> Who wished me old Trouble and Strife could see me now? <laughs> trouble and Strife? Yeah, yeah. Trouble and Strife. That's my wife, Governor. Here, yeah. sit down yourself, sir. Come on, go on. Sit down. Try it. Go on. Go on, Governor. Take the weight off your plates of meat. Well, what barbaric jargon do you speak? What on earth are plates of meat? Plates of meat is feet, Governor. That's rhyming slang. That's right. That's right. Rhyming slang. Go on, sit down in it. Go on. I'd be well. Oh. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Ain't that comfortable? Yeah, Go on. Don't you answer with the arms, Governor. Ain't that carving flea? Ain't it just ducky? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, it is. But, but I don't want the wretched thing. There's been some mistake. Uh, so you'd better take it back to London and tell him to sell it. I, I don't want anything of my brother. Jump into your effect. Can't see why you don't want to sit in a nice chair like this, Governor. But you, you're the one that gives the orders around here. Come on, Bertie. Come on, get your bag into it. Yeah, all right, I'll Let's be... get back in the van. All right, yeah, come on. Yeah, be... Away they go. go. Oh, bless you, Rob, Governor. We don't worry about that sort of thing, do we, Bertie? Of course not, Alfie. We've had a nice drive in the company anyhow, didn't we? That's right. Let's get these old horses going. Good day, Governor. Uh, good day, Good day, Governor. Good. That was a false trail, Holmes. Obviously, he knew nothing about the chair. He thought it was perfectly harmless. And, uh, as indeed it was, that the murderer would have thought it fatal. 
I've slipped up in my reasoning somehow. Confound. Oh, but of course. Oh, what a fool I am. We can get back to London as fast as these tired nags can take us. Come on, get up there. Get up there. Uh, what's the next move, Holmes? Back to Edward's house. And the staging of a little drama that I'm sure will give us the final answer to this problem. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I've got Miss Irving, young Binion, and the butler waiting outside. And, and no one knows we switched the chair. Splendid. Uh, you are sure that this is the harmless chair, yes, Of course I am. Look here. I sit in it. So, run my hands over the arms. Yes, this chair is harmless, as every person save one will know. Show them in, Lestrade. All at once, Mr. Holmes. Uh, no, I think we'll take Miss Irving and Mr. Binion first. Oh, right, you are, sir. Uh, Miss Irvin, uh, Miss Opinion, uh, come in, please. Very well. Oh, Mr. Holmes. What's the matter, Miss Irvin? It's just so horrible seeing you there in the same chair with your father. Oh, Mr. Holmes, it's a trifle too macabre for you to assume the position of the corpse. Please get up. But it seems to be the most comfortable chair in the room, and I do like my comfort when I interrogate witnesses. However, it's hardly chivalrous, is it? Uh, Miss Irvin, please sit down, won't you? I, I, I don't like to sit down in the chair in which Father oh, died. Oh, Miss Irvin, he couldn't bear to see you standing. Very well, then. Don't sit down, Harry. Why not, Binion? What's the matter? Isn't the chair safe? No, no. Then perhaps you care to sit in it. To prove that the chair is safe. No, no, I... Sit I, down. I, very well. There. Splendid. Curious chair, isn't it, Mr. Binion? I wonder about these carvings on the arms. They look almost as if they might activate concealed springs. I wonder what would happen if I... No, for heaven's sakes, Mr. Holmes, you're trying to kill me. Kill you? Then you know how Sir Edward and the policeman were murdered, eh? I, I, I knew it must have something to do with the chair. You knew more than that, Robert. You planned it. I remember now that when we went to the shop, Be you... Quiet, Harry. No, 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 Watson, don't go after them. The start will stop him. In any case, the police are at the door. Oh, 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 I'm tired. I think I'll sit in this rather fateful armchair. So it was young Binion all the time, eh? Yes, and he all but outsmarted me. I reasoned that somehow the murderer must have intended the device of this chair to clear him. And suddenly I saw the real motivation. How better establish his innocence than seeming to be obviously guilty, and yet leaving a trail whereby an astute deduction would seem to clear him. Yes, his idea that Mr. Irvin came to you. He used you as a, as a cat's boy. Well, that's right, Watson. I'm afraid this whole case is a rather humiliating experience oh, for me. Well, why, why do you well, say that? Well, the guard had arrested the right man in the first place. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. Oh, my dear Watson, I shall never hear the end of this. Never. Ha, 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 ha. As usual, Doctor, that was a swell story. <laughs> Imagine Lestrade accidentally arresting the right man. Well, he had that one coming to him. Poor fellow, he'd been outwitted by Holmes so many times, he was beginning to get an inferiority complex. <laughs> what about Miss Irvin? How did she take it when her boyfriend, Binion, has proved guilty? Well, when she realized that her sweetheart had actually murdered her father, as they say in the penny thrillers, her love turned to hate. But at first, he, he took it pretty bad. Uh, I could imagine so. Mr. Bartell, my boy, that's one of the disadvantages of being a detective. When you bring the guilty to justice, you very often cause the innocent to suffer too. Believe me, never become a detective. Stick to being a, a wine expert. Are you calling me a wine expert? Oh. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. <laughs> well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, now let me see. Next week. Next week, I'm going to tell you a strange story that took place in one of the smaller states of Middle Europe. It concerns a young prince, a most unusual concert, and a beautiful contralto who sang two days after we'd seen her die at the hands of the firing squad. I call the story The Haunting of Sherlock Holmes. Doctor, that's one I've got to listen to. Uh, yes, Mr. Bartell. And everyone should also listen to what Secretary of Agriculture Anderson says about saving used kitchen fat. We've all got to keep turning in every bit of used fat. Take it to your meat dealer. The shortage of fat is worse now than ever it was. And unless we help, and we all help, 
we'll all be faced with a serious shortage of soap. Yes, a serious shortage of paint, lubricating oils, drugs, and many other things that require fats in their manufacture. It's up to us to keep turning in every bit of used kitchen fat. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Alger and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Musgrove Ritual. Music is by Dean Fox. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight.